Hi, this is Ellie Fishman. Welcome to our latest vodcast. And this one's going to be, I would guess, a two-parter. It's going to be on CT of the abdominal aorta, aneurysms, dissections, and repair, and everything you wanted to know. So let's look at some definitions. What's an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Typically, it's defined as a diameter over three centimeters, or a dilated region with a diameter greater than 50% of the normal region, so 1.5 times its nearest neighbor. There are many reasons for abdominal aortic aneurysms, including just simply aging. They're more commonly seen in older patients. And there's an increased incidence in patients with hypertension, patients who smoke, patients with connective tissue disorders or familial. Think about things like Ehlers-Danlos, think about things like Marfan's. And of course, there is also infection, which is fairly uncommon. Mycotic aneurysms would make you think of, but we see them very infrequently. Some basic facts, the most, uh, the infrarenal abdominal aorta is the most common site of aneurysm formation. Aneurysms occur up to four times more commonly in men than women. The incidence in men older than 60 is 4% to 8%, while in women under 2%. Risk factors as mentioned include age, hypertension, COPD, smoking, male, and a family history of aortic aneurysms. And the prevalence of abdominal aortic aneurysms of those who had a first degree relative with an aneurysm is as high as 30%. And you could see, um, sometimes you get things in the mail where people want to screen for aortic aneurysms. And people have spoken about that, perhaps using just ultrasound, just to get a very gross look at the aorta. And in the era of whole body CT, looking at the abdominal aorta was one of the things that was commented on as something that would be very valuable. I mentioned about some of the hereditary processes, type 4 Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan's, and Lois Dietz are three things that come to mind. And of course, these not only involve the abdominal aorta, but involve the thoracic aorta. Sometimes things like uh, Lois Dietz is more common in the thoracic aorta and in the great vessels off the arch, but all of them can be considered. And when you start seeing family members where well, you see certain specific aneurysms or appearances, it makes you uh, think about uh, these congenital or genetic diseases. Um, and Lois Dietz, for example, marked tortuosity of the vessels, even in young patients, particularly the carotid arteries. Now, there's lots of interest in when do you repair aortic aneurysms. There's some discussion, but some basic rules. Fusiform aneurysm over 5.5 cm warrants repair. Because the one-year incidence of rupture was just under 10% for aneurysms in the 5.5 to 5.9 range, and if you reach 7 centimeters, it's 32%. So in those patients, repair is mandatory. If an aneurysm is growing over a centimeter a year, repair is necessary. Symptomatic aneurysms should be repaired regardless of the specific size, and you should consider elective repair of any saccular aneurysm. Now, when you look at repair as the processes for repair, particularly endovascular stenting, become safer and safer, people are gonna err on the side of perhaps operating or doing a procedure earlier because of the increased safety. Here's an article, endovascular aneurysm repair has become the standard of care based on lower morbidity and mortality compared to open surgery. The use of endovascular repair continues to be limited by anatomic factors, fracture, factors, including neck angulation, short or wide neck, severe calcification, access difficulties, presence of thrombus, but modern grafts in patients with proper anatomy seem to be extremely durable. So there always are going to be issues with endovascular stents. You still have to be able to get to the right spot. It needs to fit. So not everybody is a good candidate, but in people who are good candidates, the results are just terrific. And we keep seeing more and more articles in the last month, articles showing that endovascular repair is in fact better than standard surgery. Now, when we look at patients with aortic aneurysms or suspected aortic aneurysms or follow-up of aortic aneurysms post-repair, protocols become very critical. So things we look at, injection rate, we like five cc's of anywhere between 100 and 120 cc's of contrast. Omni 350, patients borderline renal function, Visi 320. Scan delay, 
It'll depend on the area scanning, how distal you need to be, how old the patient is. You could do it with triggering. There's a number of different ways of doing it. Um, most patients will get single phase acquisition, but in some cases, particularly once patients have been stented, you'll be doing dual phase. You may do even three phases, non-contrast, arterial, and delayed. When you look for endoleaks, sometimes endoleaks are only seen on delayed, not in the early phase imaging, and ideally antecubital injection, which is what we always want. Your scan protocol will depend on your scanner. Thin sections 0.75 by 0.5 works. Uh, you can lower the dose on these studies. As I mentioned, you can do, if you're doing thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta, a 30-second preset delay on a fast scanner. That works well. But you can do bolus tracking. And depending on the area scanning, you pick the target, whether it's more proximal, like the ascending aorta, or is it the iliac bifurcation, or it's in the popliteal artery. All of those can be valuable trigger places, depending on if you're scanning thoracic or abdominal or runoff, or all of the above. One of the things you'll see in my case is the importance of processing, combination of vessel tracking, bone removal, negative angio display, or three of the things. So here's a runoff study in a patient with a fempopateal bypass graft. And just to show it to you from a couple different projections, and then what I'm able to do is track along the vessel. So now I can see the graft, proximal and distal anastomosis. Everything looks patent, so you can see that very nicely on this vessel tracking, and his tracking on the contralateral extremity. And then I could go in and remove bone. Bone removal is particularly easy with dual phase or rather dual source imaging. But even with classic single source, bone removal is a standard on all workstations. And so you can see the images with bone removal nicely showing you the uh, uh, aorta through iliac bifurcation, SFAs, the popliteal. You also can see the negative display, which looks more like an angio. A lot of the referring docs like the negative display, and it's very easy to switch from one to the other. So if you need to, just make both of them. Bone removal is critical. We've developed bone removal algorithms in the past, but dual energy is ideal. Uh, the K edge is really what's most critical, with the K edge referring to the spike in attenuation that occurs at energy levels just greater than that of the K shell binding because of the increased photoelectric absorption at these energy levels. K edge levels vary for each element and they increase as the atomic number decreases. So, for example, calcium to iodine, which is critical if you want to see the vessels but not the bone. K edge of 4 versus 33 because of the atomic number of 20 versus 53. And you can see that'll give you the spread that you need. You could do this dual energy with two x-ray tubes like Siemens or one x-ray tube like GE. There's certain advantages and disadvantages for both, but both of them can give you quality studies. The other thing about dual energy, particularly as you're able to lower the KVP, iodinated contrast shows an approximately 80% increase in attenuation at 80 KVP compared to 140. So the lower KVP, you can get by with less contrast, you can get by with less dose, and you can reduce artifact as well. Viols wrote an article showing how dual energy can really do a good job, particularly in the head and neck region, for removing bone. Head and neck region with classic um, techniques was always very difficult. You would either not remove enough bone or too much of the vessel. With dual energy, he was able to show that it works uh, faster and it's more accurate. And then, simple example with dual energy, again, this is MIP. On the MIP, you, the bone obscures things. Take the bone away, voila, beautiful example, or here as well. So again, the ability to use the technology and the techniques that are available become very, very critical. Now, once you have a patient with an endovascular stent, what do we do? We do non-contrast scans. We then do arterial phase imaging, and we do a delay at about 80 seconds. We look at images with axial and multi-planar, including curved planar, 
as well as MIP and volume rendering. So all of those are valuable. So let's take a look at some examples. Endovascular stents, what do you need to know? Well, if you do a successful endovascular stent repair, over time the aneurysm will sac will maybe stay the same but will typically decrease in size. That's the best way of knowing things worked well. But if it increases in size, you typically have an endo leak. If the positioning of the stent changes, migration or kinking, you have a problem. What about branch vessel compromise, most commonly the renal artery? Infections a possibility, limb thrombosis, aneurysm formation elsewhere in the body. Well, if you have a patient who has something like Ehlers-Danlos, you're going to see aneurysms from the aorta to the uh, SMA and celiac to the carotids. You'll see them many places peripherally. So again, uh, if you have a patient who has one of the syndromes, taking care of one aneurysm does not guard against the next. And also makes the point when you're doing patients who have syndromes, make sure you don't have a satisfaction of search where you find one aneurysm and you stop. You got to keep looking. So here's a good example of a successful stent placement. You see baseline. You see it one year later, and the aneurysm has decreased in size by approximately one centimeter, six to 4.8. Now, when we look at stents and stent placement, and we look at complications, we talk about three timings. Immediate is under 30 days. Short term is 30 days to 12 months and long term is over 12 months. So that becomes important. So when you say short term, some people think a couple of days. No, 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 no. It's a month to 12 months out. When we look at endo leaks, people divide them into five types. Type one, flow from inadequate graft apposition at proximal distal seal zones. Two, which is the most common retrograde flow from the aortic or iliac artery branches, be it lumbar, IMA, internal iliac. These patients may end up with embolization. Type three, flow from inadequate graft to graft apposition at component junctions or from tears in the endograft fabric, so graft failure. But it's kind of these little leaks that occur in the middle. So you kind of know it's a type three. Type four is flow through the pores of the fabric. Very rare these days with new material. And five is refractory occult endo leak. When you talk about device failures, you can imagine migration, folding, tears, dislocation, or fractures are all possibilities. Now, there have been a number of different articles. Um, and the thing about endovascular repair, it's been a gradual process. Remember, in the beginning, we did only very sick, very old patients. Then we're moving it now to patients who are really in good shape but the endovascular repairs tends to take less hospital time, less complications, with better results. So one of the things we have seen, of course, is the reason results are better is because the graph material now, the design is so much better. It's so much more customized. But obviously, in more than a decade, things will change and have changed. In this article by Barrel, and this is 11 years ago, over an eight-year period, 988 patients had an uh, endovascular stent. 42 or 4% required secondary interventions. The mean time from initial operation until second operation was almost three years. Those are some of the failures they've listed. Another article, Caltes. Endovascular repair is the treatment of choice for high-risk patients. A small but significant number of clinical failures were observed during the long-term follow-up. So in that article, things were not perfect, but I will say we are better in technique. We have better graphs now, and we are doing much better. In that same article, um, this was with a Zenith stent graph, was used in the majority of cases. Complication rate of under 5%. Success rate was 93% at a month. So you can see even then, the results had become very, very good. Same thing, after a mean follow-up of 52 months, overall mortality was 25%. Aneurysm-related mortality was 2%. Rupture happened in four cases. A final clinical failure rate was 13.4%. So we are getting better, and that article is a couple years old, but just to give you the point of how we progressed.
I gave this talk at RSNA a couple years back, so I wanted to show the progression. Uh, this was an article from 2012 looking at the VA, 881 patients, asymptomatic aneurysms uh, were candidates for both procedures, and patients were selected, and the endovascular repair and open repair resulted in similar long-term survival. Endovascular repair led to increased long-term survival around younger patients, but not among older patients, which was a little bit of a surprise. Letterly goes on to say that our results suggest that endovascular repair continues to improve and is now an acceptable alternative to open repair, even when judged in terms of long-term survival. Now you fast forward that seven years, we're even better. This article by Douay a couple years ago, overall use of endovascular stents has risen from 5% to 74% over less than 10 years. In hospital mortality rates for rupture and eruption cases have fallen more than 50%. Lower mortality rates, shorter length of stay, despite a higher cost initially, justify the use of these stents. So again, it does mention not every patient should get a stent. People with very unusual anatomy or other issues, it may not be the thing to do, but in most cases it is. Here's an article by Chang. 23,670 patients, half of them receiving endovascular stent. And again, endovascular repair was associated with improved 30-day outcomes as well as significantly improved survival until three years post-op. Interestingly, after three years, higher for patients with an EVAR. Now again, what that means, they were having some complications. Again, think about the fact the graphs continue to get better. And it's interesting, uh, in this article by Cheng, after three years, again, EVAR repair was associated with higher mortality, but it did not reach statistical significance. So it's something we're paying attention to. I think one of the challenges with graphs, of course, it's like almost any procedure. You can put it in. You can tell what, gets, what works. But the question is, how long will it work for? So it's only by having it in patients and then watching carefully will we really know. Von Schenk made the point 12 years of follow-up, no survival difference between patients with open or endovascular repair. Endovascular durability and need for continued surveillance remains key issues. And we do follow these patients. So again, it's something that needs to be considered and needs to be thought of. Now when we speak about leaks, let's look at some examples. But maybe what we should do we're like 18 minutes into this. Let's just, all right, let's look at some of the leaks. Type 1 endo leak. Proximal distal stent not in complete contact. So you're seeing the leak really high or really low. Diamond of the aorta may be too large at the stent landing zone. Gap between stent and aortic wall allows blood to flow into the sac. And here for type 1 is a nice example. You can see the leak coming upward there or coming downward there. Type 2 is the most common, up to 20% of patients with endovascular stents. It's the one we look for. The majority of patients will uh, spontaneously resolve over a couple 30-day to 60-day period. So management becomes questionable depending on the patient about watching versus doing something. Here's a type 2 endo leak, very nicely seen. Just a couple more images showing that. And you can see the density will vary between early and late. And as I mentioned, sometimes the uh, most impressive leaks will show better on the late phase, which is only 70 seconds out. Sometimes you'll see it on both phases, sometimes only one phase. The patients who have problems typically have it bleeding on the arterial phase, and it looks worse on the venous phase. Now, when you evaluate patients, you need to be very careful. You need to measure things at the same place. So it means you may need to measure it again. Someone measured it before, maybe they measured a different place than you're measuring. And in this case, you're going from 7.6 to 8.4. The aneurysm is growing. Visually, it looks like it's growing as well. So something will need to be done. Or in this case, large aneurysm, and you can see type two again, there's an endo leak posteriorly on the right. You can see in this case, the uh, endo leak had an enlarging aneurysm and had a leak. And you can see very, very nicely, there's the leak. And again, this is a patient on the way to spontaneous rupture.
when you see an aneurysm enlarging, when you see blood around the aneurysm, blood near the stent, you can see here, look at all that contrast. That's extravasation. This patient's going to have a surgery, trying to repair or graft or do something, but um, embolization is not going to work here. Surgical intervention is usually necessary, and you can see it very nicely here. Then type 3 endoleaks are uncommon. They arise from poor seal between the components of frank separation. It's associated with aneurysmal sac present pressurization, increased risk of rupture. Uh, when it's found, it must be treated either with a relining stent or a autoiliac device or fem fem bypass. So it becomes very important in these type 3 leaks to make sure you know what you're looking at. And here's a good example here of a patient non contrast CT. You see the aneurysm, you see the stent, and then on the arterial phase, you see the very active extravasation coming right through the stent area, through the stent material. Nicely shown here on the coronal, nicely shown on the volume rendering, and here it is again in the volume rendering, gray and white versus color-coded uh, rendering, but just a really nice look and showing you that leak going right through the mesh. So that's a very, very nice example of that. Another case here with an endo leak, very nicely shown with cinematic rendering. And again, this endo leak is going to be a type 3 endo leak. This was a complicated case. Look at all of those bypass graphs from the SMA celiac renal artery that's present. But again, um, you can see the vessel and you can see some of the complications. And again, one of the nice things about 3D cinematic is the ability to show the complications, show the extent, the orientation. And again, you're creating an infinite number of 3D views that can be used for evaluation. Again, you could change the lookup table to optimize things. What else? Type 4 endoleaks. Diffuse contrast blush occasionally seen immediately after implantation. It's usually a reflection of porosity of the graft material and usually self-limited. We don't see this very often. Type 5 is refractory occult endoleaks, and those can be catastrophic. Um, here's a good example. There's an aneurysm, and it's getting larger. So that means it's leaking, though we don't see an endoleak. Here it is one year 7 cm, here it's 7.6, and then you follow it up and now you see active bleeding. So again, it's something to be aware of, but it is a challenge in, in that regard, particularly early. Again, the idea about patients with enlarging aneurysms needing procedures, and this is a good example because you don't want to have a patient who's now rupturing their aneurysm. The morbidity and mortality are gonna be incredibly high. So why don't we do this? Why don't we pick up here at device failures, and I'll show you some examples, and we'll do a little bit more discussion, and we'll take a five-minute break. Thank you very much. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.